My name is Eric Sylvania, and I am a project manager at the NASA IBMV facility in Fairmont, West Virginia. Mars 2020, which is carrying the Perseverance rover, scheduled to land on the surface of Mars on uh, February the 18th. Join in and watch it live on NASA television. This spacecraft, which includes the rover and this helicopter I'll talk about here in a, in a moment, uh, has been on a journey for almost seven months and over 300 million miles. One of the most critical parts of the mission itself is what's called the entry, descent, and landing phase. And that's literally where the spacecraft plunges through the thin atmosphere of Mars with a heat shield um, at a speed of over 12,000 miles per hour. And then it uses a parachute and what's called a, a powered descent to slow that rover to about two miles per hour. So you're going from 12,000 miles an hour down to two miles per hour and became famous for being known as the seven minutes of terror because if that entry, that descent, and that landing doesn't happen in the way that it should, essentially the mission is over. And then it uses a large sky crane to lower the rover on three cords that will then softly land the rover on its six wheels on the surface of Mars. The cords will be cut off. And it'll take a moment or hours or days to kind of pause and essentially take a deep breath <laughs> and say, are all my systems good and is everything working uh, the way that it should before I start doing anything? And once it gets there, it's going to land in a place called the Jezero Crater. Lots of discussion throughout the project about where it should land. But the Jezero Crater is a large impact crater. It's about 28 miles wide, a little bit north of the Martian equator. And uh, they picked that because Jezero once contained a lake, which scientists believe is one of the most ideal places to hopefully find evidence of ancient microbial life. And that's essentially what the main question of this Perseverance rover uh, is trying to answer is, was there ever ancient life on Mars? Once the rover checks itself out, it'll begin its efforts to collect and store rock and soil samples that will hopefully be returned to Earth by a future mission. So that's another key point is this is just one step in a long process of collecting, um, analyzing, and conveying certain amounts of information back to scientists here on Earth. The goal is to send future missions and potentially humans to collect those samples. One additional tidbit, kind of late in the project, was introduced called Ingenuity, and it's a really, really tiny, super lightweight helicopter that is attached to the underbelly of the rover. It's called a tech demo, so it's not tied directly to the mission objectives for Mars 2020. It kind of is just taking a ride, and they're hoping to be able to demonstrate that you can have powered flight, in other words, a helicopter that is powered and flying through the atmosphere of Mars on another world for the first time. This would literally be history-making uh, type of activity if, if the helicopter does what it's supposed to. And it'll fly around it through a series of flight tests over about a 30 Martian day uh, window and um, then convey some information back about what it sees. And, and how that goes. Some people who live in West Virginia but aren't aware that NASA has a program here think that it is the 4 and 5 facility or the pink building along I-79. And uh, it's not the 4 and 5 building. It's IV and V, and that stands for Independent Verification and Validation Facility. We are the program that's responsible for NASA or ensuring that their safety and mission-critical software is the right software and it's going to do the right things. It's our responsibility to uh, ensure that those uh, high-cost and high-critical missions that have software on them, that the software is going to do what it's supposed to do. And um, it goes back to a tragedy that occurred back in the late 80s in 1986, and that's the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Essentially broke apart about a minute and 13 seconds into its flight, and unfortunately, all seven crew members lost their lives. So coming out of that tragedy, the agency did a an investigation, an incident report, and essentially identified a number of things, but the ever-increasing role and importance that software played in the work that the agency was doing. And so about, I guess about six or seven years later, 
in the early 90s, 1993, um, a grant was provided to West Virginia University to build what is now known as the IBNB facility. And so we've been around for a little over a quarter of a century. Most recently celebrated the renaming of our facility, and, and I bring that up because a woman who has gained the notoriety that she has deserved for a long time, Katherine Johnson, who's depicted in the movie Hidden Figures, and was born in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Uh, they renamed our facility uh, the Katherine Johnson IBNB facility a couple of years ago. So uh, it's gaining a little bit more attention, and uh, deservedly so, but it all points back to that 1986 uh, space shuttle Challenger tragedy that, that kind of birthed a recognition of the importance of software. So our program, the IBNV program, has supported uh, a number of different Mars missions over the course of the last several decades. And it's all part of essentially a long-term plan by the agency to collect data and collect information about the planet Mars, the surface of Mars, its atmosphere, essentially to determine whether or not it would be habitable for humans. Yeah, we're all very excited about this mission that will, at least the landing will be culminating after six or seven months of traveling over 300 million miles. So the, the type of work that we do is focused on the software and the role that software plays what we term as mission critical or safety critical system capabilities. Throughout the life of a mission leading up to the launch, going into the cruise phase as it makes its way to, in this case, its destination, Mars. And then most importantly for uh, the Perseverance rover is the surface operations that are going to occur. We've been working on Mars 2020 for about six years, uh, starting back in late 2014. Science missions are generally shorter in duration, at like the five to ten year. NASA's human exploration, humans back to the moon in 2024, which is uh, only three years away right now, those efforts have been going on for decades upon decades, uh, following the um, space shuttle and then moving into other types of crew vehicles and then engaging with industry partners and people literally spend their entire career working on one rocket or one spacecraft or one crew vehicle. My job is day-to-day -day interaction with a team of five to ten analysts who are looking at the software requirements, looking at the design, looking at the code and the testing of it, getting the right product for the agency that's going to fulfill its mission, in this case for Mars 2020, getting that rover to the surface of Mars and then performing the surface operations. Starting with a team like I, I described, uh, it's essentially made up of people that have a background in either software engineering or computer science or one of the core engineering programs, you know, something like physics or uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, thermal engineering. Pretty much all of the STEM and even to some degree kind of the STEAM with the introduction of arts. Within our program and within the agency, people with any type of a degree and any kind of a background could find a home at NASA. Just a number of different types of opportunities that NASA as an agency has, and, and our own IBNB program here in Fairmont, West Virginia has. There's a lot of work that's being done on the financial side. There's a lot of work being done on the scientific side. There's a lot of work being done on the engineering of the actual hardware. There's also work being done from a science perspective and why are we doing what we're doing, educational outreach. The exciting part to me personally is knowing that I'm part of something that is much bigger than just myself, my team, the program I work for, even the agency, that, that the purpose of what we do at NASA is intended to impact literally all of humankind. The science that is done, the technology that is developed, it's, it's that sense of being part of something that is much bigger than myself. And so being able to kind of lose yourself in that, so I find that very exciting.